all right big up to everyone um welcome back to another um youtube video uh this is uh race tutor in ja and uh, we want to see if we can continue um dissecting the 2022 cape unit one paper two as you guys know your exams are coming up very soon um let's see how best we can actually assist you guys with that progress all right all righty so let's see what we can do right now all right guys so let's see if we can uh, dissect this particular question it's a question two um, of the 2022 paper paper one sorry paper two rather of um, the unit one um, uh, syllabus itself all right so what you need to remember of course when it comes on to transverse or waves in general all waves they transmit um, energy all right so energy is transmitted or we can say energy is transferred transfer of energy and not the matter meaning that the material that makes up the the waves they are not practically being traveling they're not traveling with the the energy of the wave per se they just simply oscillate all right whether they move back and forth for longitudinal or they move up and down in their fixed positions that's how um and not and not the matter so in essence what i'm saying here is that uh, the similarity is that all waves they transfer energy all right or they transmit energy uh, and not the material or the matter that makes up or the particles that makes up these waves now in terms of difference um, one key difference speaks to how the particles oscillate so for a longitudinal wave right for longitudinal um wave those particles they in a sense vibrate or oscillate uh parallel to the wave direction while while for transverse while for transverse um, the particles vibrate perpendicularly so particles vibrate perpendicularly to the wave direction so I hope you can remember those things of course you might not get the same question again this year but for the benefit of those who want to see how it, how it looks then that's what it would look like all right now let's go to, go to the next question um, so the next question said we should give one example of a transverse wave and one example of a longitudinal wave all right so um should be quite simple so generally speaking uh you have several examples of um transverse so this would be like your transverse wave all right so light or you could say electromagnetic waves or em waves uh we could talk about water waves water waves um those would be the main ones really okay uh, but now when it comes down to longitudinal your main example is sound waves and that would include your ultrasound ultrasound types of waves uh, not all sound waves are really 
um, longitudinal per se because there is what we call infrasound and that infrasound waves can be categorized into two two types P and S waves okay um, I think the P waves is the trans is a transverse and the S waves is the uh, longitudinal but don't quote me right now um, but if, if you stick with ultrasound then you should be fine okay now the question then go to ask us um, explain how a stringed instrument such as a guitar produces sound um, so generally speaking when strings are under tension and they are plucked a series of standing waves are produced if you know anything about standing waves um, they tend to form uh, these con uh, these points that call that, that are called nodes and antinodes right um, but when it comes on to the antinodes those are the section where the largest amplitude is produced really and at that point you find that there is a a large resonant frequency those resonant frequencies um, can be tuned um, to giving you a particular frequency of musical notes so that is in a sense so when you think about a guitar and you look on it and you see the different what we call frets right in between those frets you would expect an anti note to be produced so when you press on that uh, that section of the string really you are somewhat altering the entire wavelength that is traveling through the through the standing wave and by extension there will be consecutive uh, anti nodes being formed between that location really yeah and in a sense that's how you can uh, in a sense uh, I would say by the way so where, where you put your finger on the guitar between the frets that would seem more like the nodes but that node now affects the overall number of anti nodes that we can find and those anti nodes will resonate and give you the different uh, different frequencies that matches that particular um, string based on the tension in the string and everything and also the thickness of the string all right okay so the question continues here where we have a setup um, to investigate uh, waves on a string more than likely this would be talking about standing waves again now it says that at certain setting on the the signal um, frequencies the signal generator rather a standing wave with three anti nodes is set up on the string it says here in the space below you're going to sketch it and you're going to label it and so on i think this probably was a four marks or three marks question so you would just go ahead and represent your wave of course as best as how you can draw it that will be good for you now what i normally do to know whether i have completed the number of anti nodes i need to see three uh consecutive um or let me put yes you need to see at least three um you could call it let me see what i can refer to it as one two all right let me just see something here so uh i would have to delete one of these I would have to delete one so let me just quickly uh, fix that so you can find your your own unique way of um, trying to uh, know when to stop per se all right so generally speaking standing waves is just like a reflection you know all right it's just like a reflection but obviously you want to make sure that you have your the ends are kind of closed off because the waves are reflected all right um, pretty much the truth about standing waves is, is just that the wave is traveling this way then when it meets the boundary it comes back and goes like this but because of the frequencies it goes so fast that it creates these loops that you that you might think they're actually loops but they are really not it's just how the eyes actually perceive it right so right now i have my um three anti-nodes so this would be my anti-node so you'll be labeling this anti-node 
okay so this is one this is two this is three i would say that the antinode is like that section where you have the largest amplitude so if i were to divide the wave you know in half really across um this would be your amp your amp amplitude right and that's like the highest uh displacement of the wave now they want you to of course talk about the the note the um the nodes those are simply the points where these this uh destructive interference takes place really and you find that um no sound will be produced at that point so this should complete that and give you your marks really yeah so once you're able to do that and identify the different antinodes then you should be good of course if you can get them to be on the same level in terms of the height of the antinodes then that's also perfect now they want us to write an equation yeah for the wavelength when the string has n antinodes and use this equation to calculate the wavelength uh, from the, the diagram that we have there so there's a general um, formula right that says wavelength is equal to 2l over n where l is the length of this of the string and n is the uh, antinodes okay so n is the antinode l is the length of the string so we can use the length of the string and the number of antinodes to determine the overall wavelength of that particular um, particular string now if they ask us to calculate the uh, the wavelength itself then we need to go back to the diagram and put in the, 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 the values accordingly yes now we know that there's three antinodes so therefore we can say n um, sorry we can say the lambda n is equal to obviously this and then we can say lambda when we have three antinodes will correspond to 2.3 uh, times my length of the string which was um, 2.76 uh, uh, they just want to compute that value all right So at this moment, we're getting that our wavelength is going to be uh, 1.4, uh, uh, sorry, 1.84 meters. That just tells you that um, when you when you go back to the, okay, I can't I can't go back a bit, but when you look back at the at the sketch that we did previously, yes, all right. Alright, sorry guys, I'm just trying to sketch this thing accordingly quickly. Uh, the length of the string, as we said, was um, practically uh, 2.76. Now, you should note that uh, one wavelength would be from here to here, okay? That's where one wavelength would be. So, all the way from over here to here. I want to sketch it a bit better so you can see it. All right. So this will be representing the entire length of the of the standing wave. And you should know that to complete one wave cycle, you should have at least one complete crest and one complete trough. So from all the way of all of this including this would be one will be considered as one wavelength and it is telling us that it takes uh, roughly two third of the entire um, wave to give you one um, one one wavelength all right of course this can change depending on the number of antinodes that you have okay all right all right so now they ask us to use the equation that we would have just uh, determined which that which tells us that wavelength is equal to 2L upon N and you this is just a common common thing you should, have, should always remember pertaining to standing waves they want us to link that to frequency all right and give us this equation so what you need to probably quickly remember because we're dealing with waves wave we can uh, come up with the wave equation that says um, a speed of wave is equal to uh, frequency times uh, wave wavelength okay and we could then go ahead and 
substitute what we know the wavelength is in terms of n and l okay so v is equal to frequency times 2l over n let's just transpose now and make f become the subject so f is going to equal to uh v times n yes um and then that will be divided by 2 l all right so at the end of the day it's the same thing we they just factorize out the n um, which we can simply do that it doesn't really change the overall setup but that would be the equation that they want us to come um, of course come up with all right now the question continued and uh, in a sense they want us to plot a graph all right but not only that they want you to take that equation that you just found really and you're going to kind of link it back now because the equation um, has this in it yeah it says frequency is equal to uh, n um, times v over 2l okay we're going to plot a graph of frequency versus um, antinodes so this would be your y variable this would be your x variable what you now need to be able to can process quite quickly is that uh, it's practically a linear equation that we have just created really yeah and you know with any linear equation y is equal to mx plus c in this case we could simply say that there is no y intercept because the line should draw through the the best fit uh, region sorry the line the, the 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 line should pass through the zero mark really yeah so now I'm, now I'm just thinking that i didn't do that exactly but at the end of the day it shouldn't affect much of the the answer really but what i want you to note is that if you were given something like this make sure that when you draw the line yeah it passes exactly through the zero mark because that would in indicate that the y intercept is equal to zero but what i want you to clearly see as well because f is my uh, y variable and x is my n sorry n is my x variable all right so let me just say that again so i know that f is my y variable and i know that um, n is my x variable so whatever is left beside the, the the x variable that automatically equates to what my gradient value should be so m is going to equal to v over 2l this is very this is a popular thing in physics you know where you have to compare these things we're just simply comparing them all right and that is just based on the standard that it is a y equal mx plus c uh, equation per se all right so in this case you would plot the graph and everything you know draw a line of best fit gives you four marks then they ask you know to use the graph to determine the velocity of the um the string now clearly the question did not tell you anything about the velocity but using the formula that we know pertaining to frequency and the, the, the antinodes yes we can take that equation and now linearize it such that we can then figure out what the what you call it now what the um what the what, what the, uh, the the velocity is going to be so let's see if we can do that together quickly yeah so this would be the graph that i would have plotted uh please if you can make your graph take up 75 percent of the y axis and 75 percent of the x axis that would be considered as a good representation of a graph okay um in my case i had to cut it very short but please make sure you're doing that so that the examiner or whoever or the marker whoever is doing the thing knows what you are you're doing all right it might you might run in a bit of complication when you're trying to figure out your scale or whatever but there are ways you can quickly go ahead and fix those so make sure your those games are your your graph platinum uh, skills are up to date so this would have been my graph yeah um as i said before i should have tried to make it pass through the zero mark okay this looks like a line of best fit to me because it, it kind of balances 
out with a few other points that don't pass through the line yeah um on on either side of the line so you want to make sure that over here there is an even distribution of the 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 the, the, the points that uh did not pass through the line so like this one okay did not pass through then this one did not pass through so that kind of strike a balance between your out i don't want to call them outliers but more so of those points that did not pass through the 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 the, the the line itself and maybe it could have been adjusted a bit better all right so i want to find the gradient quickly you want to make sure that you choose points that are quite easily for you to read yes and you also want to make sure that it takes up at least 50 percent of the line so the two points that you choose can you know gradient and for, for, for some of you guys, they, they probably teach you these things differently, but I just have kind of like one set way of doing it. Um, persons might say rise over run, please. So the gradient here, or the formula is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Please, these are not uh, saying y square and all of those things. That's not what it means, right? I probably should make a bit of uh, adjustment. It's, this is like a, a subscript, yeah? It's like a, a subscript. So it goes at the bottom all right so what you would be doing now is to choose two points yes that we can uh, easily read them so i'm going to choose this one so by the way if you're choosing the points you need to indicate on the line where you're choosing those points okay and to distinguish between those you use a dot all right so since i've used x already x is already I use a dot because you want your examiner to check where you chose the points from all right uh, okay and then i'm going to just use this one because it seems to be a little bit better here all right you you, you have full access and full control over this uh, i always tell my students not to use any plots that you took from the table to find the gradient so never you use those x's that initially was plotted because you can run into problem because with that so please choose points on the line that you initially did not plot from the table so now i have done that so this would be like my x1 my y1 yeah in most cases you can also use the triangular method per se where you extrapolate and you you know in a sense draw a triangle to highlight that region of the, the space that you're working with okay so for this it's going to be um 3.5 comma uh 300 hertz and these are obviously not going to be as, as accurate as how yours would be. Then the next one is going to be 6.5. And of course, this is my uh, X2 and this is my Y2. Normally, when you're, you're writing coordinates, we put the X first and we put the Y after. Because it's just common courtesy. Like when you're saying your alphabet, you know, you're going to put the one that comes first. So like X comes before Y. So... We kind of keep that same uh, trajectory, chronological order or whatever, alphabetical order. Uh, so, yeah. Um, in terms of the X2 now, the X2 is going to be... Um, so, like in this case, I am going up by 100, okay? And this is that skill that you should also try to remember. It can help you a lot. So, imagine that for every 2 centimeter. Oh, by the way, you should have a scale on your graph, you know. So the scale should say, uh, so for the x-axis, you were saying that uh, 2 centimeter is equal to 100 uh, units. And for your x, oh, sorry, this is for the x, sorry. So, so let me say it again. So for the y-axis, 2 centimeters is equal to 100 units or 100, frequent, 100 hertz. Uh, x-axis uh, two centimeter is equivalent to one unit or one uh, node, anti-node. All right. 
so that's what you would be doing or for your skill okay um now if i want to figure out the smaller individual boxes in between uh the one centimeter box here right there's a way how we can do that the first thing is to count how many boxes go vertically upwards to your first value like which is 100 so there are 10 boxes in between that so all i need to do is to divide 100 by 10 and that tells me that each of those small individual boxes going up is going to be 10 okay this can be very very helpful okay um and you do that just for uh your set intervals that you're doing going up by so like in this case now i look right here i know that this is going to be 550 so the next one here is automatically going to be um 575 yeah 570 570 rather 570 right so with that now you just quickly calculate your gradient so gradient as we said is rise over run or your y 2 minus your y1 divided by x2 minus x1 so if you put in those values so my 570 minus my 300 divided by uh three sorry 300 minus um did i say that sorry let me fix that so divided by uh 6.5 minus 3.5 okay taking the calculators we can quickly compute that so at the end of the day i found out that my gradient m is equal to 90 and remember now we said that our gradient is equivalent to something yeah our gradient is equivalent to v over 2l so what i can do now is to say 90 times 2 times uh 2.76 is equal to my speed my velocity of the of the of the of this of the sound wave okay so let's see if we can just quickly compute that so i'm getting a value of um four nine 496.8 meters per second well in your case you should write it like this m s to the minus one and that is your units for the for the speed okay all right so with that being said they now ask us it says an explosion occurred uh at one end of a pair of length 125 meters the sound reaches the other end of the pier by traveling through three mediums air um, water and a slender uh, handrail of solid steel list the order of the medium of the, of the media rather through which the sound waves travels at other end or uh, at the other end of the pier and this is give reason uh for your 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 response um so in a sense what i think they want you to to state here is which medium you know the sound wave is going to travel through faster so you can list out those those uh those particular um particular uh, mediums so so of course so it's going to travel the thing is you know the order can be listed in, in different ways you could list it from um fastest or from slowest to fastest or from fastest to slowest okay so we're going to list it from um slowest to 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 fastest so in in air right to through water then through solids so we're, we're we're listing it on the basis that um as a matter of fact i think it's the other way around let's put it the other way around let's put it the other way around and the main reason for that is the sound wave is going to travel through the metal fastest yes 
then the water, then the uh, the air. So that's that's how it will it will reach. So let's put it according to how it's going to uh, uh, reach to the other end. All right. And then for that reason, you can just simply state that um, sound travels right uh, the fastest in solids then liquids okay then our uh, ear and this is this is due to the density of the medium right so uh solid is much denser yeah or is the most dense so you would expect that all right it says calculate the time taken for the sound wave to travel through the water to reach the other end of the pier okay all right so this is not like any type of echo type of um type of question so we're just going to simply use speed is equal to your total distance all right over the total time so i think we're given the distance that it traveled which was a uh, one um 125 so 125 divided by your 1420 sorry 486 right so the time is going to be quite fast yeah it's going to be 0 0.08 seconds so we'll leave it as that okay all right i think that was just a repeat question really all right but now we move on to uh question um three which is going to require a lot of attention um so what, what i'm going to do i'm going to of course upload that question in another uh video all right thank you guys for watching uh please remember to comment subscribe and uh like the video share uh and you know turn on your post notification bell um tell a friend a friend tell a friend to tell another friend about our uh, race tutor in ja um where we provide uh past paper solutions and of course different physics uh content all right so that's it for now please remember to subscribe subscribe and to like the video